I think Edith Ackermann is also well known in this community. She speaks more about creativity, as I saw from your paper. Amusement, delight, whimsy and wit. For us non-native speakers, this is all the same. <laughs> So we will see what the difference uh, here and, and what is the connection to creativity. And Edith, you always say, Edith, you are from MIT, but you worked a long, long time for MIT, but in your bio is written, you are honorary professor of development psychology at the University of Marseille in Paris, and in France. So, Okay, and you are now working in MIT again? Uh, I work all the time. Okay, okay. And Foreign no place I'm also very interested in what you are telling us about the amusement, delight, whimsy and wit and the connection to creativity. Please. So, uh, I know that I was working in Paris for sharing and I sort of take two aspects of my split personality and I talk of sort of one extreme of what of my interests uh, in the first part and then other aspect of my interest when we come back to uh, rethinking what we mean by programming and what we would like to see how that changes. So, uh, when I am with my constructivist friends, um, I notice that play is used in many different ways. Because it is a word that is very hard to define. And it is mostly used by my constructivist friends to mean the art of theater. And my reflection comes from the fact that I am not pleased, because I also work with architects, to define playfulness or our ability to come up things obliquely or develop a sense of humor, we, to equate this with the kind of playfulness that we see in the process of thinking. So my message in this part of my split self presentation is don't reduce the art of possibilizing through play, the art of bringing in very awkward connections what's possible and what's actual uh, that is very characteristic in pretense play but also in humor and more generally our ability to suspend this belief with the process involved in particular, which has to do with hands-on making stuff and things. So I just want to take this little slice and develop it probably more than anybody who will be interested in hearing words. The reason why I do that is that in the field of architecture, the notion of delight and functionality. Delight is one of the key three notions in trying to define what the contribution of architects are about. So it's not just this fluff stuff that artists you know, talk about. It's something that is very important in uh, promoting actually our ability to see formulate this because I worked also with people at the Exploratorium Science Museum and I know how the ideas that are dear to my friends in the tinkering studio at the Exploratorium Science Museum have traveled also from the East Coast and were actually started also uh, at the Media Lab by Richard Resnick's group. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I need my hands to talk. <laughs> So, 
they changed the name from playful inventions and exploration to the art of tinkering. And I am an old nostalgic of the playful invention and exploration focus. Uh, and it's my favorite way of describing the intersection between make or create, between making things up or imagining, and play, which we will understand better what it is about, uh, versus creative versus inquiry. And I would like to add that in addition to pie, pie in the sky is just a little uh, sort of pie plus plus version. And it is defined as something that is pleasant to contemplate, but is usually very unlikely to be realized. And what actually happens in play, or in theater, or in other modes of oblique ways of, and non-literal ways of going about things, is that, well, some, sometimes it does happen, and that is how, um, you know, we can open transformative spaces that move, that transport us beyond wow, as Mitch said, or surface poking, at the same time uh, not cornering ourselves in sort of being industrious alone, to just being laboriously sort of wor working through the assignment. Usually when you speak with constructivist, my constructivist friends, and uh, it's a legacy of Seymour Papert's contribution and Piaget's legacy, we talk a lot about the interactions between hands-on and heads-in. And Seymour actually used these terms. And also, because we are interested in the genesis of things over time, we like to think about not only what inspires you, us, what creates a sense of wow, but how to constantly renew and refresh this sense of wow, to then start acting and immersing ourselves again, trying to get in touch again, and develop different ways of actually reflecting in action or on action of contemplating what we have been doing of gauging what we have been doing in the light of what we, we wanted to do. And Mitchell has spoken a lot about, in Scratch, I think it's the big contribution when I compare it with uh, Logo, is the Vygotskian notion that uh, we learn great deal from sharing uh, what we are interested in and also our creation. So that's the puzzling one. It's your last pinch. And the, the way I like to push it now is to say, you know, we, we, there is a big difference between playfulness and creativity, uh, and, and curiosity, and also the kind of inquiry that the designers are work, that the designers are I work with develop is very different from the type of inquiry learning that is advocated by, um, um, mostly by um, okay, so so well, I just want to quote here something that uh, Jean Piaget always said when he was talking about early forms of pretense playing children. He said, when my daughter Jacqueline, who was then three years old, takes her mother's sweater, ro rolls it in a bowl, you know, puts it under her ear, puts the thumb in her, in her mouth, and takes her baby, and says, this is my pillow, and the baby sleeps, and the baby sleeps, and she wings up, she laughs. She thinks that she's cracking a joke. It's very funny. So what is interesting in this scene, and Piaget acknowledges it, that there is no distinction between pretense play. They develop at the same time. The ability to suspend this belief 
to start cracking jokes, to do it puns, to be interested in language in all its most crazy aspects, like it's just a trace of gesture, but it's also the puns, and so this all appears at the same time with the beginnings of the symbolic function. And unlike what many developmental psychologists thought, or actually, for that matter, computer science have thought, to actually uh, be able to, of symbolic creations is not just about language development. You actually can uh, engage in symbolic activity without uh, using language in the way in which we think of it. And when I think of the contribution of symbol, pattern, I think that what he has actually uh, helped me at least understand is that the use of words and language can be thought completely, not just as descriptions of what happens or a way of telling the tale of what's happening, but to take language in a way, or words as commands, to have things happen, but on a different plane. In other words, we can also think of the uses of the way in which we try to capture our experience and to reenact it is about the uses of words and other signals in different ways than just to describe, but to use them as ways of giving commands of ordering. It's like coming back from speech to speech act, and coming back from representations to enactment, as Jérôme Gruner spoke about it, which is at the heart and core of why, at least in my understanding, programming was so important to, to, to Packard uh, as a way of taking what we, our intuitions, let's say, about movements in space, putting words on it, but then using these words as commands to, to tell somebody else to do the same things that we know how to do intuitively, but cannot get described. That's a very long, long introduction. Um, so, to Piaget actually play and plays mostly about pretending, even in constructive plays. That's my, my stance here. It's, it's not all the same. To construct with Lego blocks, or if you are a baby, a little, little baby before the age of two, you are actually obsessively repeating things. And exploratory play in that sense, we call it play, but I think it doesn't have the quality of role and pretense play that uh, uh, Piaget was pointing to as a core and part of what he needs to be played. Now, among cognitivists in particular, play or whimsy, and I don't want to say to, to, be, to be unfair, but mostly among educators also, is usually see as a motivator, as an okay or even necessary spark to ignite, to ignite, to, 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 you say, to, to, to fuel learners' interest. It's like bringing the fun, right? Let's bring in the fun. The problem is that sometimes when you bring in the fun, you kill the kind of uh, whimsy that, that is inherent to uh, the ways in which young children at least engage in self-directed work. Because children themselves have not made the distinctions that we are making, and their ways of actually coming to try to understand things take different paths than the paths that the grown-up rationalists think are the best in order to try to understand. Now, as soon as it becomes too crazy, these uh, uh, children's ways of you know, being theatrical, when you see kids play, it's like watching Beckett uh, theater piece like 
you know, waiting for Godot or something. They are nuts, but in, in the most fantastic possible way. And uh, this is never seen when the children start entering what Hunziga called the magic circle, and it is a pen. It is, it is a particular little world that in which permissions are defined as being different than out of that circle. It's an invisible circle, but even uh, sort of higher evolved animals and young children give each other very precise signals to tell each other whether they are in play mode or not in play mode. And the ability to shift between being inside of or outside of the sacred circle, it's, it's a silly word, but that's what Hunziga used and other, other, other playwriters use. It means that even a young child knows very well, if I, if I am mama and I take a banana and I put it on my ear and I say, hello, uh, this is a telephone. Even a two-year-old will not interpret my statement, this is a telephone of meaning, this is a telephone. The child understands that it means this is meant to be within the context, within the specific context of our play now. This is meant to be taking the role of, um, of, of a telephone. And now we can go on. Now we have an agreement, we can go on. Gregory Bateson spoke beautifully about the kinds of clues, gestures, uh, the tones of voices that are needed for other people to recognize whether you are in play mode, mode or not in play mode. It's not necessarily verbal. So for example, if mom, if mom says in a very nasty mood and without changing the tone of her voice, you say, this is a telephone, the child gets confused and says, no, it's a glass. So the pragmatic context matters. And what I think that we don't pay enough attention to is to actually let these uh, sort of non-literal ways of using these movements in and out of, of, of uh, different sets of permissions. I don't want to say reality or out of reality because there is no such thing as one reality. But it's different kinds of micro worlds. We can talk about this in another session. Different kinds of micro worlds in which the different sets of constraints and permissions are understood by whoever is in the circle as being of a certain kind and different from what they would be in another circle. So that's one important aspect of play that I think is worthwhile uh, you know, taking into account. Uh, and I have spoken a lot. These are all sort of yeah, hey, I continue, you know, I just continue. Um, actually what I do is I look more at play itself and I think what, what, what is important in the end is the notions, poetic sources is important. Uh, this is actually a performance by Karen Wilkinson. We were talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the wobbling machines, that the tracers, that are actually sort of completely neurotic versions of turtle geometry, <laughs> where you actually put a pen on a device and you have it move, not by commanding its move through writing a program, but by actually, uh, let's say, equipping the device with motors and other, it could be sensors in this case, or just a silly motor, and they wobbled around and leave traces. So there was a whole activity on this. But then we had the long discussion about you know, how, how the art of leaving traces is important. And you see that it is also the beginning of literacy that many scientists have spoken about um, the importance of the gesture that leaves a trace as the beginning even of writing and so on. But they are always also 
very funny sort of more artistic renderings of the same idea. Uh, one is by Karen herself, who just attached some little, she created a little clothes for, for <coughs> the slug, how do you call it, the, the slug? Uh, and then just attached a pen with, with, a, with a little china ink and lets it wobble around. Uh, and then we have people also at the Exploratorium, because what, you see the, the Exploratorium is a museum of art, science, and human perception. So they always have artists in the two teams, hardcore scientists, and people who know a lot about human perception and cognition. But they focus a lot on the agility of human perception. And uh, when you work on a theme like this with these people, you come up with different types of products. So you have your robot, that like Mindstorm-like robot that follows the line. You have things like this, and you have these artists like Ned Khan, who actually attach pencils to a tree that when it's uh, blown by the wind, creates also uh, patterns of uh, drawings on the floor. Um, I am very influenced by uh, Arthur Kessler, and actually Alan Kay mentioned him and his work in a last uh, presentation that he gave at MIT, and I, I was very pleased about it. Um, in the Art of Creation, he wrote this thick book, it takes you ages to read it, The Art of Creation. Arthur Kessler actually defines both humor and creativity he puts them on equal foot, which is remarkable. Um, as the perceiving of a situation or idea in two self-consistent but habitually incompatible frames of references. And he called dissociation the act of shifting between and bringing together in new ways different logical orders or mat matrices of thought. And he offers many examples of the sense of surprise and double entendre, like qui quo that arise from just opposing of otherwise unlikely order of things. Important in Kessler's view is again this emphasis on the centrality of these displacements, artful displacements, of playful exaggerations. Exaggeration is very important because it allows you to focus on something more than you would if it was just realistic and you render it. And suspension of disbelief in human creativity, whether humorous, <coughs> scientific, or artistic. So now that's where it becomes more tense. Because normally when we talk about the work of artists, we never assume that they do things like this. How could they? They think in a very different way. Um, in order to try to bring together these two apparently different ways of going about uh, getting to understand the situation or inquiry, I want to introduce here the notion of mindfulness as developed by Ellen Lander and other people. I don't go into the yoga home, home version of it. I will take the Harvard you know, the rationalist Ellen Langer view on uh, mindfulness. Uh, and the, 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 the other one, equally nice, uh, is uh, more the Zen, the Zen version of it, which I leave for another purpose. But the idea is that in the beginner's mind, and this is the notion of adopting a beginner's mindset, and we just had the thesis defense of Jay Silver, to me he is the, 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 you know, the, how do you say the characteristic, uh, emblematic uh, of adopting a beginner's mindset. Uh, at well and longer, mindfulness is about putting one's mind into what we are doing at the moment we are doing it, which is, in this sense, quite a key to Csikszentmihalyi's notion of flow. But the relevance of mindfulness to human creativity is that beyond this 
engagement and endurance that is characteristic of flow, it also keeps us alert, willing to look at things more than once, as if it were the first time, and to look at it from very unusual angle, and being in it for surprises. What she calls mindlessness, in contrast, emerges as a result of having it all figured out. Experts, she claims, are exper especially prone to becoming mindless whenever they put themselves on autopilot, when they heavily rely on acquired skills or apply standard routines, whenever they cease to look at what they know as a potential obstacle in disguise. So that's provocative. And at the core of Langer's idea of mindfulness, of, of, of uh, mindlessness, of mindlessness, which is to always think that one knows and take for granted what one knows at the point of not even opening one's eyes and ears anymore, um, lies this paradox. The more we know, the more likely we are to act mindless. And she mentions three potential sources of mindlessness, categorical thinking, that's what some of our rationalist friends like. Acting or thinking from a single perspective, which is also maybe something that the, 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 the digger in us, the miser in us, the cognitive miser in us doesn't like because it allows to me, and habituation. Now, of course, it's not an end and all. Each comes with its pros and cons. Categorical thinking or looking at things through pre-established lenses is absolutely vital for effectively operating in the world. Yet imposing our order puts us at risk of ignoring whatever doesn't fit. We become extreme assimilators, to use Piaget's vocabulary, uh, unable to see, let alone incorporate any odds. Our ability to accommodate becomes less good. Uh, in Piaget's vocabulary. We can't see anymore because we know so much. Uh, thinking from single perspective or going down a set path satisfies, as I said, the cognitive miser in us, yet blindly following a set path without budging when no perceived benefits arise locks us in. And lastly, once our habitual ways of doing and thinking become second nature, we, of course, gain influence, yet acquired habits also get into the way as soon as the conditions change. So you begin to see the trade-offs here. Being mindful, in contrast, as defined by Langer and the way I, I actually embrace this notion, is a continual and active quest for novelty or better formulated. That's the way she said. It's not that the person who is mindful wants to be innovative. It's not the uh, sort of, you know, the party line, you know, how to be innovative so here in the law, uh, in, in corporate, corporate circles. It's more that you are always, it's not a quest of novelty per se, but it's a readiness to take the next step in an unknown direction and see where it may take us, which makes for me full engagement. I like to make a comparison with oh, it's done. I'm done. Uh, with the difference between conversation and the dialogue. In a, and Maturana made this distinction, which is very useful. In a, in, a, in a conversation, you usually don't come with a plan. You actually mobilize your, your attention and interest to find something worthwhile pursuing what the, the other person said. And then you give it, take it another step, and it continues like this. And if you have two people who know each other in certain ways together, there is a likelihood that they will end up all, often talking within the same sort of range of topics. But it's not planned in advance. So I think my time is over, so I'm just going to jump all these. I, I made a talk that should last 12 hours. Um, <laughs> I, I actually had this emblematic figure to try to understand better what is all at play. Uh, so it's the craftsman who is the labor, uh, homo laborans, the, the trickster who is the homo ludens, 
and the poet who actually uh, resists naturally to explain away the world, but rather uh, sticks to the image. And the image here is more of the union kind of image. It's not about you know an icon uh, that again describes. It's just something that captures and and, and conflates a series of uh, very deeply felt urges. Uh, again, art is a, 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 I bore with. So I just want to finish with this, maybe. Um, if we think of the difference between, and these are, these are preliminary distinctions, but if we, if we think about creative, or let's say design, design inquiry, design inquiry, even within design inquiry or creative inquiry, there are different ways of, I hate this dichotomy, but that's as, as far as I could get here. There are different acts. Some people are more interested in making sense of things. Some people are more interested, not some people. At certain moments in the process, you prefer to focus more on making sense than on making sure. So it's trying to understand versus trying to prove. Um, made to move is the idea that whatever you come up with should be able to talk for itself. It doesn't need extra instructions. So a doorknob that is well designed doesn't need an etiquette of top that says push the door. It should be able to convey the meaning. Versus meant to prove, it's like, you have to add instruction and you have to explain why you are right and what you think. This one has a lot more to do with the agility of our mind's eye than with the inertia of our mind's sort of more rational side. Uh, and I mean, I let you go down the list. One that is important to me is this notion, because Seymour also talks about it. He spoke not just about the holding power of uh, important ideas, but also the evocative power. And the evocative power is different from the explanatory power. There is, there is also this distinction between literally saying it all in your face, you say it the way it is, or more figurative ways. And Brunner has written beautifully about in modes of, of writing about you know your typical sort of academic report versus a more literary essay. It doesn't mean that they don't necessarily seek the same truth, but they have very different ways. Allegoric versus prosaic uh, delight, amuses, argues, and convinces. So I stop here because I already spoke too much. And in the next session, I am going to take on a more rigid hat to actually um, suggest that maybe in, in programming activities, when we think about programming activities, maybe, and this is a discussion that we have had initially, maybe there are playful ways of thinking about very specific um, ways of calculating or of, of, of calculating very rigorously that we can explore through programming instead of having programming help us do all of the work that I've been talking about. So in the second part, I will talk more about uh, different views that different people who engage in programming have about what it is all about and, and why it is important. Thank you. Sorry for